second week in the authority uh, series, and I thought, what well, says authority better than a nice pair of slacks? How about that, huh? That's right, eat your heart out. It's the only nice pair of pants I have, so we'll wear them again in another year. Um, there, one of the, another reason that we played that Fortunate Son uh, song was there's so many things just like that we hear, and they instantly take you to a certain mindset, uh, it takes you to a certain, like, gets you in your feels a certain way, and all of a sudden it invokes, like, this emotion that you've always felt. So if you hear that song, probably, uh, especially if you are, were closer to that time period, uh, directly go to the Vietnam War protests. Uh, there are other words, if I say them, you instantly have an emotion about that. Uh, if I say... Governor, you have an emotion about that. If I say president, you have an emotion about that. If I say stepdad, you have an emotion about that. And one of the reasons we wanted to do this series is because if there are words that just take you to that place automatically, there's a really good chance that that becomes very calloused in you. Uh, it becomes something that you are no longer seeking to understand. You're not asking for God's input inside of that. And so I say those words, and you go, well, I've got that all figured out. Here's what that means. Here's the feeling that it brings up. And so we want to say those words that you've always felt that thing in, maybe God is asking you to open that part up to a word that is called conviction. Last week, we said that conviction, for some reason, gets a bad rap, but I don't think there's a more beautiful word than conviction. Uh, conviction, essentially, is the God-inspired prompting to start or to stop something. I mean, that's, that's beautiful. That he, God knows what is best for you beyond even how things feel, beyond even how things think. He designed you. He has a plan and a purpose for you. And so God will speak to you in different ways to say, hey, would you begin this or would you stop doing that? Because that is going to lead to more life. So he's going to say, hey, if you stop this particular action, this particular self-destructive pattern, I promise you that you will not be in your shame cycle that you're causing yourself. And you will be willing to draw near to me more often. If you start in the morning spending time with me and your first concept of who you are are the words that I speak to you, not that the world speaks to you, then you will be more inclined to draw near me throughout the course of a day. Right? If you start this road towards forgiveness, for instance, then I know that that bitterness will not have a grip on your soul and that there will be more room for us in a deepening of relationship with us. And so uh, here's what the enemy wants to convince you of. The enemy wants to convince you that conviction is all shame. Conviction equals shame. Conviction equals condemnation. You should feel bad about yourself. And when you feel bad about yourself, then you try to fill that gap with doing better. That is the enemy's ploy, right? To feel bad and then to try as hard as you can to earn righteousness, and God is saying, no, 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 you have a wrong view of conviction. The enemy will try to convince you that conviction equals shame when in actuality, conviction equals freedom. 
So throughout this whole series, uh, know that we said it last week, God is going to speak differently to you than the person to the left or the right. Your application of our messages will be different than the person to your left and to your right. That is called conviction because God knows what is going on in your heart and your soul, the small steps that you need to take to open up those areas that have been calloused because he wants to break through those and say, there is more for you there. It's not condemnation. It's not shame. There is a uh, an opportunity for a deepening of relationship with God that you've been designed for. Um, all right, so last week, uh, just very briefly, we, we hit on a few key concepts. One is we said that all authority is established by God. Uh, that is good authority, bad authority, God honoring authority, God denying authority. All authority is established by God and that God works through authority. And what we tend to do as humans is that we go after the what, the what being the policies, the what being the specific rules, the regulations to determine whether or not we are going to obey. And uh, what God says is this paradigm shift. And it does not go rule by rule. Instead, I'm asking you to trust deeper than that. And it is not about the what, it is about the who. And we've seen all throughout human history that God does things in the undercurrent where we cannot see, that he is working miracles for eternity that we cannot comprehend. And what he's asking is beyond what we see and feel, a lot of times, will you trust that I am doing something here? And so very basically, he said, do not rebel against the authority that I have established. I know it looks whack. I know that that thing is playing out in your life terribly. But I need you to trust that I'm doing something bigger. And by the way, the, the point is not always what happens Some. Times the point is for the health of our souls, the health of our hearts. And what God can do with a church full of people who have softened their hearts to the point of loving beyond themselves, how he can use us. But we ended up with a, uh, a teaser last week. We said, you know, those principles sound great, right? We read your attitude and response to human authority is a reflection of your attitude and response to God. And you're like, that's great, but, you know, I can get that tattooed, but... Um, also, Graham, live in the real world here, right? Like, we do live in the real world. And uh, every one of us has had that horrible boss. And everybody's, everybody here has had, like, that dirtbag gym coach, right? We've all had something that it goes, surely you don't mean this person. Surely we're not supposed to submit to this person. And then, here's, honestly, this is what makes it worse is, you got this guy come up on stage with just a fire pair of slacks, and he's talking about, uh, you know, this book from 2,000 years ago. Actually, it's probably the biggest deterrent to Christianity for a lot of people. Maybe not Christianity, but certainly the biggest deterrent towards Scripture or the Bible or the application of the Bible is people just think, hey, uh, um, when I read this, or when I hear this, it feels like I'm in a way different reality than the Bible. Like, maybe it's been misrepresented. Maybe it's been mispresented. Um, maybe you just haven't understand, uh, understood the culture or the context. A lot of times it goes, it's, I'm not even just talking socially. I'm just saying, this seems to be a different reality. Like, I, I have a reality. And you say all authorities from God, please don't... Ex uh, don't rebel, and at the same time, like, what if my boss is hitting on me? Like, am I supposed to submit to that, right? What if I have, seriously, what if I have a stepdad who very obviously loves his biological children more than me? Am I supposed to submit to that? Like, what about these horrible, horrible things in my life? Like, it feels like we're in a different reality here. Like, speak to the real world. Um, so, really, those are great questions. And we'll talk about those next week. Just kidding. <laughs> I was kidding. All right. So even, even more so, we got, um, here's some verses. And I don't want to belabor the point of this tension, but I do want to say that I understand. Because so many times when we read this stuff, your thought is, do we understand the cost? Do we really understand what's going on? So the, the uh, 
<coughs> Scripture says, <coughs> can I grab a water at some point? Actually, you going to chuck it? Do my wife as a can in honor. I'm, I would not be able to catch that. Uh, Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is, this is the Pastor Eric's favorite verse. For the husband is the head of the wife. And uh, Darlene's least favorite verse. As also Christ is the head of the church and the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And you're thinking, yeah, but I am also like a college-educated, mature American woman who owns her own business, right? This isn't leave it to beaver. Like, can't we, why is there submitting, right? Can't we just like mutually respect each other? Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. If you grew up in a church-going home, my guess is that this was used misused pretty ferociously, right? It's like, are you sure that that falls under that? Submit, right? Yeah, you have to do that. And you just got this bad taste in your mouth, not just for authority here on earth, but for God's authority. Romans 13, 1. Let every soul, and this is uh, what we read last week, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. And so we got a lot of conversations on the patio last week, ones that I, I agree, hey, like seriously, I know this always sounds like the let's take it too far, but it's not. What about Hitler? Uh, what about the officers who are forced to kill? What about dictators in other areas of the world who are killing by the thousands? Like, are we supposed to submit to them? And very basically, we're going to unpack this. But what we have to understand is that there is a, an interplay for us as Jesus followers to authority that does not excuse, sometimes does not comply, that is not rebelling. That's very, very difficult. That's also why I said this is not a one-size-fits-all, here you go, here's how you apply it in your life. My goal up here is to give you some talking points with God for this week. We all have to find out how God is going to work in the course of our life and in our spirits to apply this. Um, the story that we referenced last week, that was kind of our tension story. In Babylon, there was this king. His name was King Nebuchadnezzar, which is like the coolest name ever. And uh, he in implemented this decree. He said he built this massive statue, 90 feet tall, 9 feet thick. And he goes, whenever the band plays the music, Everybody who is in leadership is going to bow down to the statue. Um, well, there was three uh, Jewish men who actually had been promoted to leadership at that point. Their name were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And whenever the band played the, uh, the music, they wouldn't bow down. And so this one guy witnessed it, went to the king, and goes, King, they're not bowing. I'm almost positive that's how he said it, right? Like, who? These guys aren't bowing, and we are. And so the king's like, bring them to me. Brought them up, and uh, he goes, hey, uh, I, I had this decree that if you did not bow down to the, to the statue that you'd be thrown into the furnace. So, like, is, are, are the reports true? And they said, yeah, we will not bow down except for to the one true God. And he said, well, then the consequences are the same. He ordered for the furnace to be turned up seven times hotter than normal. In fact, it said that the guys who were leading the three men to the furnace to put them in died from the heat of the fire. That's how hot it was. And once the three men got in there, they were put into the furnace. And it said that God saved them miraculously inside that, that not one hair on, either, on any of them was singed. They came back out, and King Nebuchadnezzar had this like miraculous turnaround where he goes, obviously your God is the one true God, which is a crazy story. And also hints on this, this very thin tension of what it looks like to not comply and not rebel. A lot of times, not doing something does not mean rebellion. And when they refuse to bow down to this other God, here's what he throws them in, and they believe that God is going to save me. Now, um, 
Uh, there are three kind of principles that we learn from this that we're going to maybe help frame your conversation with God this week. Three things that you can ask him and say, God, what does this look like in my current circumstance? And uh, so number one is this. There are levels of authority. There are levels of authority. So that's where this woodworking comes in. I want us to view it like this. In our lives, the different levels of authority, first, uh, let's say we have the authority of God. And we can misconstrue it in our minds, especially the authority that's over us here on earth will try to misconstrue it. But ultimately, all of this serves to glorify God and to praise and worship God. That's what we're here for, is our relationship with him. Even the way that we have interplay with authority is all to glorify God. So there is no authority that is beyond God, that is above God. That is, that is the foundation of authority in our lives. Next one up. We would probably have parents. In fact, he talks all the time about the way that we honor our parents is reflective of the way that we um, accept God's authority in our life. It is something that's there from birth, can't escape it, even if you want to. Next level of authority, this would be the governing authority. So everything from government to, you know, the staff of Bell's Outlet when I'm there. Right, whatever inside of that place is. I love Bell's Outlet, man. I love that place. <laughs> Bell's Outlet. If you're doing sponsorships, look me up. Um, it is wherever we are, the ones who set the rules inside of that place. We are still subject to those authorities. And then finally, the last authority is us. And this is us. Now, here's the problem. And here's why I wanted to bring up the different levels of authority is because what God is asking is that we place him at the utmost place of trust in our lives. But you know what we normally lead with? We normally lead with us. When we lead with us, we lead, we lead with what we think is right. We are self-trusting to determine the different policies and, and processes that we think should be applied, and we put that first. And honestly, we kind of get this reverse. Because the second goes, hey, if there's any governing authorities that align with the way that I think, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. I'll give you my vote. I'll give you my respect. I will allow you to have authority in my life as long as it lines up with what I think. And finally, if there's any room for mom and pop, sure, you guys want to fall in line. I know you guys are old and you don't really get the way the world works, but if you want to fall in line, I'll put you there. And then finally, we go, and God, that's cute. You can be a part of this, you know. Uh, I'll tell you what, if you want to speak to me on Sunday mornings, go for it, right? There, I, got, I got about 3% left that you can speak into. And what happens, of course, is that falls every single time. So what God is asking when we talk about levels of authority and what we spoke to last week was it is obvious in our response to the authority that God gives of where we place the trust, where we place the trust. And ultimately, it is putting God at the bottom of that. Um, now, going back to the how do we respond when one of these other areas is screwing things up. Pretty much, if somebody is asking you to do something immoral, if somebody is asking you to go against what God ultimately declares to be right or good, if they are directing you to do that, then what your move is is to go to the next level of authority is to go to the next level of authority. I very often cannot determine what is best for myself, right? And so when I'm looking at what to adhere to, I, I, and all of a sudden this next level of authority says, hey, I want you to do something that I know is against how God has called me to live. Then I have to petition to the next level of authority. And ultimately what's really tough, by the way, because you get to this place where, let's just say it's, government, or let's say it's something that you're like, the only next authority in this whole chain of command is God, then you have to listen to God. And not doing something is not the same as rebelling. Let's look at this story. They get to a point where they were being asked by the superpower at that time to worship another God besides the one true God. And they knew that there's only one who deserves praise and worship. 
I can't do this. And this is the speech that they make to this level of authority, the speech that they make saying, no, 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 I know who is my foundational authority. Verse 17, they say, well, let me take a sip. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty, but even if he doesn't, we wanna make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. I mean, that's bold. That's bold. And they're not saying, uh, we know 100% God's gonna deliver us from this because it worked for them, God saved them. But guess what? Just about every disciple, every follower of Jesus was martyred. Okay, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here just painting this beautiful picture. God is saying there are consequences because we live in a fallen world. And the authority that is over you, whatever your walk of life is, I promise you is not perfect because there's only one who is perfect. And so there's going to be earthly consequences that can still maintain the integrity of our soul. And the, the eternity of you and your relationship with God matters far more even than the earthly consequences. The disciples understood that even when they were martyred. So let's just take a real life example, right? What about bosses who ask you to do something illegal or immoral? And they go, um, and you're like, hey, Graham, you know, my boss told me I got to take my clients to gentlemen's clubs where gentlemen very rarely are. I just came up with that. That's pretty good, huh? Um, <clears throat> okay. I've got to entertain them, right? That's where we do real business. Um, so what do we do as, as a Christ follower? I, three things. By the way, all these are on the app. Uh, so look through these later because uh, I think they're really good principles just to apply. Here's the first thing you do. You get asked to do something that, that you just know uh, you can't do. Number one is to pray. Not just pray for that situation to change, to pray for your boss, to pray for that manager. Um, remember that God's number one desire uh, in the way that you have interplay with the people around you, that's authority or just peers, is for you to be an extension of God's love. Don't forget that. We can start to hear this stuff. We can go, you know, fight the powers and what policies and you know, what's the letter? And God goes, no, no don't forget that when I came here, I humbled myself to earthly authority that treated me very poorly. Don't, don't forget that Jesus said, hey, if somebody slaps you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. It's not this desire of what is right even. Your, your first and foremost should be, God, how can I show love inside of this? If, if somebody steals your cloak, give them your tunic too. Desire love. Does your heart break for that person? Does your heart break for that person, right? Um, I wrote this, uh, like we mentioned last week, but are we praying for that person to know God? Are we praying for instant karma for that person? Anybody ever gone to YouTube and typed in instant karma and then just watched hours of people getting what's coming to them? Me neither. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but man, our hearts can go there fast, can't they? They can go there fast, and I, that person just needs to get what's coming to them instead of our heartbreak uh, for who that person is and them actually knowing God, desiring them to know God. And this bleeds into number two. Number two is explain your personal convictions. Number one is pray for that person. Second is explain your personal convictions. Don't jump right to slash in the person's tires, right? Like, explain. And when you explain with this compelling heart of love, and it's not a, hey, look, I know you're going to hell, but I'd rather not, so I'm not gonna do this. Like, what, what does that do, right? Instead, if there's this heart bleed, if there's a desire for love, a desire for that person to understand a God who loves them, that I promise you the way that you explain your personal convictions is gonna come across very compelling. And it's not a, I'm against you. Instead, a, this is freedom for me, and I want freedom for you as well. Pray for your boss or manager, explain your personal convictions, and number three is present a creative alternative, right? 
and just say, sir, ma'am, like, honestly, like before God, I just I can't take these people to a gentleman's club. But how about instead I take them to Rooted? Just kidding. <laughs> how about I take them to Man Cave Monday? Um, no, but man, can I take them golfing? Can I take them to a restaurant, right? Be, be somebody who is trying to attack this problem from, from a motive of love, even a motive of connection, uh, instead of jumping right to let's go to war, let's figure this thing out. So number one that we talked about, uh, there are levels of authority. Second is there are limits to authority, there are limits to authority. And this is just understanding your interplay with authority. For instance, right, your boss or your teacher, or your coach, like they can't make rules in every area of your life. And actually, uh, the way that you respond to authority, this will be a big one, because anybody who has tasted authority in an unhealthy way becomes addicted to that feeling of authority and will try to overstep their bounds in your life. And it is okay to have a firm understanding of where authority starts and stops. That is not rebelling. I had a boss one time who just loved being a boss. And it wasn't you, Pastor Eric. And, um, <laughs> and uh, we were in an like, airport one time, and he comes up to me. I was like 32. And he's like, hey, um, he's like, hey, before we get on the flight, I need you to go to the bathroom and then uh, get some trail mix. I was like, I'm 32. Like, don't tell me when to go to the bathroom. You're right, I do need to go to the bathroom, but I'm going because I want to go to the bathroom, not because you want. The, an understanding of where authority starts stops. By the way, uh, if you are the person in authority, have a keen eye on this as well. Have a keen eye on this as well. We want to, we want to be um, good examples of authority. So, you know, a, a great example of this, uh, I do weddings all the time. Actually, I had a wedding that I did yesterday. And when the uh, father walks the bride down the aisle, it was one of my favorite times in the whole ceremony. It's because here's what I tell the father of the bride. I say, uh, in that moment, it doesn't matter if your daughter lives across the country. It doesn't matter if your daughter is 42 years old. You have this feeling, this paternal burden of protection you just feel it. You, just, you can't help it. And as a dad, oh man, that's going to be a tough day. Uh, but as a dad, you get to walk your daughter down the aisle and you get to say, in this moment, my role is shifting. I'm going from the protector and I'm releasing to now the supporter. And I'm trusting that this marriage is something that God has brought together, that he has orchestrated that is so good for my daughter. Boy, that guy better be good who marries Tatum. Um, the authority changes inside of that, right? There are, there are limits uh, to authority. And so I just, uh, I want us to recognize that, uh, that God right now has put you in a place of authority and, uh, and he doesn't want you to shy away from that authority because somebody else has screwed it up. Step into that in a beautiful way. Be a part of somebody's story of them connecting with God. And the final one, <coughs> excuse me, is that authority fluctuates. And that is really just to give us the wiggle room not to, to X off something and not ask questions. Authority fluctuates. There, there will be moments where you have authority. I, I mean, we even, this is kind of the have limits, but I have authority inside of here. The second I leave here and go to Waterburger, my authority fluctuates, right? And so that's why this needs to be a constant conversation with God when God, the Holy Spirit, is speaking to you and saying, here's how I want to respond. I want you to be somebody who's prayerful. I want you to be under somebody who understands other people's limits and yours. And ultimately, this whole thing is for you to put trust in me that I am using you as an instrument of love in lives around you. All right, how much time we got? Six minutes? Okay. Um, you know what? I'm gonna skip down to this because I think this is important. Hey, um, Gavin, I'm gonna skip that verse, buddy, so you can come on down. You know, when I was putting this message together, I was thinking about how important 
our interplay, our conversation with the Holy Spirit is. That when I don't have answers, the Holy Spirit has answers. When I'm stuck in my feelings, when I hear the you know, fortunate son song and my whole brain shuts off and I go fight or flight, or you hear your word, that the only thing that really penetrates Graham being Graham is God, is the Holy Spirit. And let me say this, the Holy Spirit is available to anybody. What God says is the way that we receive the Holy Spirit ultimately is when we submit to the ultimate authority of God. It's in the moment where it's, it is available to you. And quite honestly, life is borderline impossible without it. So God will put things in your life to compel you closer to him, to highlight the importance of the Holy Spirit in your life. It has to come a moment where we are submitting not to what we think, not to our logic. It's not even submitting to what our parents have said are is right our whole life or what they believe. It's not, it's not about what, what the governing authorities think or say or the ideology of society. There has to come a moment where we take this leap of faith and because of the love that you've experienced here in the church, the body of Christ, because of the way that God works on your soul, there's a moment where it goes, I am so tired of being the fulcrum of everything working in my life. I'm so tired of being the one that is holding up everything because I know what a knucklehead I am. I have to put trust in something that is stable. I have to anchor myself to something that withholds anything. And if you're in here today and you have never taken that step and put your trust in the full faith or your full faith in God, then I know how exhausting your life is right now. I know how much you're holding up. And if you, this morning, want to make that decision to say, you know what, this is going to be my surrender moment where I'm submitting to the ultimate authority of one who is good, not one who lives in the gray area, but one who is perfect, one who desires good for you, then when you do that and you submit and you accept God's forgiveness for you, you are opening up that callous spirit that you had to the Holy Spirit who wants to direct you and guide you and counsel you and encourage you. If you have questions about what that looks like, would you please, please, after this message is done, go to our prayer corner over here. Because they want to talk to you about what it looks like to open up and awaken your spirit that maybe has been dead until now. And you will find, I promise you, you will find after that decision, this submission to God, that when the Holy Spirit awakens in you, these conversations that you have with God throughout the week are way more possible God speaks so clearly to you in the course of that where there was muddled before, it can be clear now. Um, In that story that we read at the beginning, um, when they threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the furnace, it says that King Nebuchadnezzar went over into the furnace and he looked in and he goes, I thought we threw three men in there. Why are there four? And it was God who was in there with him. It was the son of man who was in there with him. And probably right now, the reason that things feel so shaky in your life is because you are relying on yourself to manage the impossible task of adhering to authority, of representing love inside of your life without the Holy Spirit, supernatural, eternal prompting of a God who knows far better than we do. Would you pray with me this morning? Yeah, Father, um, I didn't think I would end on this this piece of submission this hard, but um, man, I, I, I put your block of authority out of position, out of priority so often. And I just first wanted to confess that I admit that I am so self-reliant so many of the times. And we as a church, we recognize how messy this is 
that this isn't a, okay, got it, let's do this perfectly, that uh, this is moving forward, this is learning to hear you and your will and you directing us through the mess of imperfect authority in this world. And so to do that, we have to be lockstep with you. We submit our own ideas, our own, uh, what we think is right or perfect to you, the God of eternity. Speak clearly, in your precious name, amen.